this series we're on is, is really awesome. I'm really excited about this. We've been talking about doing a series on Acts for a while, and, and uh, with Pastor Dennis and the, the preaching team, we, we worked through it, and we figured out how to do it. Um, and what we're going to do through it, uh, Pastor Dennis talked a little bit about it, is we're going to have uh, several of the preachers around here come up and do a message uh, on close to one chapter apiece. Sometimes it doesn't quite work out like that. Um, but we're going to come up and we're going to do uh, roughly one chapter apiece. And we had it kind of scheduled out how it was going to happen. And I noticed uh, whenever I was talking to Sam that I was scheduled to do it the week after Frida Bandito, um, which wouldn't end well. Okay, it's a tough week. I would just be like laying here on the floor like, Jesus is good, I promise. All right. Um, but actually, we did some trading around, and Sam took that spot, and I got one of his other ones. Um, but it kind of got me thinking. It always seems like every time I get to preach, it's almost following something big. Um, on the more drastic end, I know uh, when my mom passed away a couple years ago, I was scheduled to preach that Sunday. And I came up and I did because I knew she would want me to. Um, but then I, on at least three different occasions, I've had a wedding on Saturday, then I've came up and preached on Sunday. Um, and then uh, the Freedom and Dito thing, I think, happened like last year or the year before. Um, but I kind of got thinking about that, that it's almost like the enemy's trying to slow you down, right? He's going to, I think our other preaching team and Pastor Dennis can attest to that. Anytime you've got a good message, the enemy's going to try to throw something at you and slow you down, right? So I, I think the enemy tried that once before in what I would say is one of my most exhausting and exciting times that I've got to be up here. And that was the week that I returned back from Haiti. Now, for those of you that don't know, uh, Jessica, another youth uh, we had at the time, and myself went to Haiti on a mission trip a couple years ago. And I knew that I was going to preach the week when I got back, which I thought, oh, this is great. This, this is perfect timing. I can come back. I can tell everyone about the trip. This is what I'm saying before the trip. After the trip, I'm like, I'm just dead to the world right now, okay? Um, but so my plan was, I knew I wouldn't have much time when I got back from Haiti, so I went ahead and I wrote out my message before we left. And, and thankfully I did, because I took the manuscript with me, and it is literally the only thing, and plus Jessica's hand that got me through my first plane ride. It was terrifying. I don't know. We had to, we had to do five more after that, so uh, I eventually got used to it, and I would... Love to go on a plane again. Um, I, I will not jump out of one, though. You can stop asking that. That's just crazy. All right? <laughs> but uh, I did. I ended up loving the plane ride and, and just loving the whole trip. But I had that manuscript with me, and I, that's the, I'm telling you, the only thing that got me through my takeoff is I'm just sitting there praying over this message that God had given me. I'm telling people, you're good, God. I believe it. <laughs> right? And uh, so that's the only thing that got me through that. But, man, while we were in Haiti, just incredible, incredible times. I mean, we got to go out. We were at what they call the YWAM base camp up on Fon Baptiste, which is this mountaintop that basically civilization has forgotten about. Um, and there's over 30,000 people up on top of this mountain. And they're living, I mean, in, in stick huts and, and mud brick houses. Like um, where we were staying, like the YWAM camp was, uh, to us, would be considered still probably poverty. Um, but to them was like a mansion. Um, so it, it was amazing. But we got to, we would open up our gates and the kids would just flow in. And, and we had the privilege that our main goal there was to work with the children in Haiti. So our main goal was to like let the children come in. And, and usually us guys, we would go play ball. We would play, they had like volleyball nets. Um, they had like a basketball, like it was like a five gallon bucket and just the top cut off of it. And they played with a volleyball. Um, so we'd play like basketball and soccer. Um, and this weird game with rocks that they were really good at, and we weren't. Um, so we got to play with them, but then, like, we'd be playing with the older kids, and, and then usually the girls would take the babies and stuff. So finally, like, these kids were able to actually go and play and be kids because at, like, five years old, your job is to take care of your, your infant brother or sister. Um, and it was just an amazing time. We got to go and minister. We went on several prayer walks. We gave out Creole Bibles, just and an absolutely amazing time. I, I, I have such a passion for missions. Um, and when London gets a little bit bigger, I'm praying to go on a whole lot more. Um, but I will say, the biggest thing that I think I did while I was there, the thing that still sticks out to me, it was, I assure you it wasn't me that did it, um, is on day three, we were going to have a soccer tournament. 
Um, and, and that's really glamorizing what happened. We had a bunch of kids come out and kick balls around a field. Um, but we opened it up to all the kids on Found Baptiste. They could just all come in and, and play soccer, and we had a competition, and they won like some hats that were donated from some church that you know, had a church name on it that they had no idea who it was. And, and, uh, but they, they had, their teams won that, I actually think, Roberto, which was the lead guy there. I think he gave everyone a hat. Um, but So they all came in, but on that day, we, we always, everything we did, we did for a purpose. We did with a mission. And on that day, we were going to bring a message, and Roberto asked me if I could bring the message. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely, I'd love to. And, and then I'm just stumped, because I, uh, ever since I started this whole uh, preaching, speaking thing, since God started this in me, because I was terrified of public speaking just a few years ago, um, I've had technology. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to write something without the ability to Google it. it it's difficult, all right? And so for a while, I was stumped, but then I came across that manuscript that I'd brought with me. I, I brought that just to study, just to be prepared so when I come back here, I, I would be ready to go. But I believe that God actually had intended that message for those children because on that day, I was able to go up and talk to 100-plus Haitian children through a translator, which was super awkward, um, but it was an absolute movement of God. I was able to go up and tell these kids uh, this story that happened with my mom. My mom had this dog uh, named Lincoln, and she had lost this dog and, and lost for months. And she finally found him again at the dog pound, but she had no way to prove that the dog was hers. So instead of just letting him go, she actually had to buy back her own dog. And I was able to tell these children about how God loved you and I so much that even though we were lost, he paid his life, he laid down his life to buy us back. And I was able to tell that and deliver that message to these 100-plus Haitian children. And on that day, I seen 19 children stand up and give their life to Christ. Absolutely the most powerful thing I think I've witnessed. And I assure you it wasn't me because I was stumbling over words and staring at a paper. And Roberto, I think, was doing most of it. I don't even know if he said what I told him to. Uh, he may have just preached the best message of his life. I don't know. I mean... <laughs> But it was just absolutely amazing. But I was studying Acts 2. This is what I'm going to be talking about today is in Acts 2. And this message is going to be titled, too far. This message is going to be titled, Reckless Love. And I just I absolutely love that song they just sang, where they sing about the reckless, overwhelming love of God. And I'm going to be talking about that, the love of Jesus. But as I was reading in Acts 2, and and we'll pick up and we'll read through it and talk through it a little bit. But as I was reading, I was reading Peter's sermon, and he holds no punches. Um, and, and he just lays out, but 3,000 people come to Jesus that day. Now, I don't know, mine's not exactly comparable to that, but I think God celebrated just as much. But I could just imagine the looks on their face. I think it was the same look I seen in these Haitian children's face when they realized that Jesus did love them regardless of their circumstances or whatever they've been through, or whatever they've done, that God is for them and God laid down his life to buy them back. See, when they realized that message, you could see it in their eyes. And I almost feel like that's the same thing that happened in this moment. That when Peter delivered this message and he told them, you know, you crucified the Messiah, but it's okay because he loves you and forgives you, that I feel like it almost connected. And... So we're going to pick up in, if you have your Bible, we're going to read Acts chapter 2. Um, it'll also be back here somewhere. Um, also, really, I didn't change that. That was supposed to say reckless love. It's cool. All right. Uh, so we'll start off in verse 1. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each one of them. That's as far as we'll go for now. So I, I have a lot to cover. I'm going to say this in the beginning. Um, but I, I'm going to stop, talk a little bit, then we'll keep going. And then at the end, I kind of have uh, something I really want to focus on. Because uh, Pastor Dennis told me to cover all of Acts 2. And I told him there's about four sermons and at least two series in this one chapter. Um, so it, it's probably not going to be able to be done that concisely, but I, I do want to hit on a few things that I think God uh, really kind of spoke to me for you guys. Um, so what we see here is that tongues of fire come on every believer. And then we were recently at a youth conference, 
and uh, the speaker talked about this, and he was talking about he, he didn't want to get into the debate between tongues or no tongues or, you know, all that. But he said, one thing is true, that when the Holy Spirit come on us, our tongues light on fire for Jesus. That when the Holy Spirit comes on us, then all of a sudden, we can't stay quiet about what we have seen and heard. That when we truly experience Jesus, Jesus when we, we truly follow Jesus, when we truly give our life and we accept his Holy Spirit inside of us, we have got to tell somebody about it. Because our tongues are simply set on fire. And that when we know something is so good, so holy, that we have been redeemed and we have been fixed. Like if we knew the cure for a deadly disease, would we not pass that on? We know the cure for sin and death. We, we, our tongues should be set on fire to tell others about it. We have the greatest cure in the world. And when the Holy Spirit enters us, we can't keep it to ourselves. We have to tell the world about it. And we have to let it out. Now, that's what I get from this. But you see, what these early Jewish believers would have gotten was a little bit different. You see, because when they see the Spirit of God, remember in the Old Testament, just about every time you see the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God comes in the form of fire. Right? We see Moses and the burning bush. We see the children of Israel led through the wilderness by a pillar of fire. When God comes down on Mount Sinai, he covers it in fire. When he comes down on the Holy of Holies, it's fire. And so often in the Old Testament, when you experience the Spirit of God in the form of fire, it was not only amazing, but it was often fatal. Most of the time, the people there died. You couldn't actually be there. You couldn't see it. You couldn't look upon it. You couldn't be in the presence because you would simply die. But on the day of Pentecost, we see the Spirit of God not killing people, but instead bringing those to life. That the Spirit of God has now moved. It was often in that temple where the fire was, that was a representation of the Spirit of God. But we see at Pentecost, the Spirit of God left a man-made temple and entered into a God-made temple. At Pentecost, the Spirit of God left that temple that was made by human hands and entered into a temple made by the hands of God. That God, His Spirit, left the temple and came into you and me. And that each and every believer will receive the Spirit of God. And it will not kill us, but it will bring us to life. So we'll pick back up in verse 4. Somewhere in here. All right. And and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are, from, are all from Galilee, and yet, they are speak, and yet we hear them speaking in our native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and the province of Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia. Egypt and the areas of Libya and Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. And we all hear these people speaking in our own language and the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they asked each other. What can this mean? Now, I wish I would have I would have brought, put the map, I'd found one and I intended to get it in here. But if you actually look at the map, look at where they are, and then look at where all the people are from, literally it forms a big circle, meaning they are to receive the gospel here. God intended for them to receive the gospel and to take it to the ends of the earth. That when you spread out, when they go to all their native lands, they cover the northeast, south, and west, and northwest, and southeast, and, and everywhere. They cover the entire world. So what can it mean that the very first time the gospel is preached, it's preached in all languages simultaneously. What can that mean? So I want to read to you a quote from a professor at Yale. His name is Laman Sinai. Now, he is an African professor at Yale, and he'll tell you that Muslims believe that the Quran cannot be translated, that the Quran is only written in Arabic. And anything else is simply a commentary or a paraphrase. So it cannot be translated. He says this, As far as Muslims are concerned, God speaks Arabic. So if you want to hear God's word, you have to learn Arabic. When Islam comes into a place, it slowly replaces the culture with its own culture. 
So places that become Islamic become very quickly Arabic. See, that's what Islam does. But when the, fir- when the gospel was first preached, it was preached in all languages at once. All languages, showing that no culture, no civilization, no people group was the definite right one. The gospel was not intended just for Jews. It was not intended just for Americans. It was not intended just for Israelites. It was intended for all people. That's what we see signified when the gospel goes out into all people at one time because the purpose was that these people were only visiting and they were going to take this message of Jesus that they had just heard and they were going to take it basically to the ends of the earth. And that's how the gospel can spread so quickly because the Holy Spirit comes on you and what happens? Your tongue is lit on fire and you can't help but tell everyone about what you have seen and heard. These 3,000 plus get saved. They hear the message, the saving, redeeming grace of Jesus Christ, and they take it to the very ends of the earth and they can't help but tell people about what they have seen and heard. That's what happens in this moment because the gospel is intended for everyone. It excludes no one. The gospel is for each and every one of us. You see, and when the gospel goes into a place, it's not like Islam where it tries to replace it. You see, what the gospel does, it goes into a culture and it redeems it. That it it exalts it, it doesn't suppress it. That it lifts it up, it brings out the culture. Now, Sinai says this, no other religion really does that. Other religions tend to erase the culture. As a professor at Yale University, I see that it's not just other religions that do that, but secularism does it too. For all of their talk of diversity, Harvard and Yale are only interested in producing different colored European liberals. He says, the average African sees a very spiritual side of the world, but when the African goes to Yale, he is told that the world has no spirits and miracles, and Yale guts him of his Africanness. Christianity helps Africans become renewed Africans, not remade Europeans. Christianity accepts the reality of the spirit world, but removes the tendency in African culture towards superstition and violence. Because it shows Christ as the victor over all evil spirits, and he overcame through love and service, not through violence and manipulation. You see, Christianity is not for one culture, it's for all cultures. And it doesn't want to change who you are, it wants to redeem who you are. That's the purpose of Christianity. The fact that the gospel is preached in all languages at the exact same time is a sign that the the payment that Jesus Christ paid, that when he went to the cross, that he paid for all sins for all people at one time. We are seeing here that the gospel is intended for the entire world. No one is excluded through that. Christianity is not just for Americans or Jews, but it's for everyone around us. Christianity, the gospel, the Jesus, Jesus Christ is for ISIS and it's for the LGBTQ community. That God came not just for one people group, and I know it gets real when we start talking like that, but God did not just come for one people group. He came for everyone, each and every one of us. Jesus laid down his life knowing the worst in the world. He came into this, he knew the sins of every single person. He knew the sins of Hitler and Stalin, and yet he laid down his life so that they may accept his gift. The gospel is for all people. It's not for one people group or who we expect or who we deem worthy. Because Jesus looks at all of us and he says, each and every one of you are my children. God loves each and every one of us. Let's continue. We'll kick off in verse 13 where we left off. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk, that's all. And I just, I wasn't sure if I was going to say this, but what exactly are they drinking that makes them speak all languages? Anyway, then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk as some of you are are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. 
And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn dark red or blood red before the great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to the cross and killed him. But God released him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life. The de- for death could not keep his gri- its grip on him. King David said this about him. I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. You see, when we know God, again, our tongue is on fire for Jesus. My, re- my body rests in hope, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave, for you know... For you have shown me the way of life, and you will fill me with your joy of your presence. Peter goes on, Dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself, for he died and was buried, and his tomb is still here among us. But he was a prophet, and he knew that God, he knew God had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on his throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses to this. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven. At God's right hand, and the Father, has, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see, here, see and hear today. For David himself never ascended into heaven, Yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of of Jesus Christ for for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said that said were baptized and added to the church, about 3,000 in all. Now, I'll pause here for just a moment because that number, 3,000, is incredibly significant. Because you see, in the Old Testament, when the law was given, it says that it was given only to Jews and that on that day, 3,000 died because they broke the law. But we see at Pentecost that the grace of God This is law versus grace. The grace of God was given to all people. And on that day, 3,000 souls were saved. See, that's the contrast between the law and grace. In verse 42, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people, and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Now, I think this is, this is very interesting because it paints the perfect picture of what the church is, what the church is intended to be. You see, in Greek, the word for church is ekklesia, and it means an assembly. It focuses on the people. But we use, our, our word church comes from the, the German word kirche, which 
is my closest pronunciation to it. Um, but it means a building where religious services are heard. You see, for so long, we have considered the church a physical structure. But re in reality, if the walls of this building fell down, the church would still stand because the church is not the walls, it's the people within them. That you and I, we form together for the mission of Jesus and we are the church. Not the building, it's a gorgeous building. I love everything we have in it, but this is not the church. This is where we stay dry while we listen about Jesus. You are the church. We are the church. And, and the intention for the church, I feel like, has been a little bit misconstrued with what I call American Christianity. Because you see, the church, there we go, the church is, come back here, the church is not a building, it is a movement. And we see that even when we're reading through the book of Acts where the church is formed, that notice what comes first. In Acts 1, we have the mission. Acts 1 is all about the mission. Acts 2 is about the church. Notice what came first. The mission came first. You see, God doesn't have a mission for his church. Instead, he made a church for his mission. Right? So he does not have a mission for the church. Instead, the mission was first that all people would come to know Jesus. And he created the church for that mission. But so often in American Christianity, we, we get stuck in this routine of, well, church is simply showing up, listening to some guy on stage, and going home. That's, that's not the church. That's an that's a entertainment. The church is a mission, right? The church is us on mission. And if we're just followers of Jesus not on mission, I don't even know if we're still called the church. I didn't look that far into it. But the church is simply us, the followers of Jesus, the disciples of Jesus, going out and completing the mission, or at least working as hard as we can toward that mission, and that is going to the very ends of the earth to make known the name of Jesus. That is the entire mission of the gospel. That is what he left us with, is go to the ends of the, world, the earth, make disciples of all nations, right? That is the mission of the church. Now, if we, we play the desert island game, I think Pastor Dennis referenced this uh, uh, a few Sundays ago, you play the Desert Island game. So what you do is you, uh, you pick up this book and uh, you forget everything you know about Christianity. Everything. Leave it all out. Dump it all on the table. You know nothing. Forget everything you know about church, the building, what we do here. Forget everything we know and then go and read the book of Acts. And then reflect on... if what the American church is doing lines up with what is said in the book of Acts. Are we living like someone who has the greatest cause and the greatest mission and the greatest reward and the greatest news in the entire world? Because the gospel simply means good news, which is the absolute best news. Actually, I read a, uh, I read a tweet this week that, that really, really hit home, really hit hard. It said, why is it that the greatest cause-driven or the most cause-driven generation in history, they're speaking of millennials here, millennials are extremely cause-driven. Millennials, despite our flaws, I am a millennial, despite our flaws and our, our selfishness and all the things we do wrong, we want to see good things done in this world. We want to help other people. We want to support things and organizations that help other people. And this tweet said, why is it that the most cause-driven generation in the world is not basically in love with what should be the most cause-driven organization in the world, i.e. the church? Because the church should be the most cause-driven organization in the world because we have the biggest mission in the world. Our mission matters a whole lot more than anything else going on in the world. If you believe that the only way to the Father is through Jesus Christ because he is the way, the truth, and life, no other way to come to the Father except through him, if we believe that, then we have the greatest mission in the world that is to make known the name of Jesus. That is the only mission that really matters. Regardless of what our day job is, our ultimate mission is to make known the name of Jesus because if anyone dies, if they walk out of our store, our business, and they don't know Jesus, nothing else mattered. Absolutely nothing else mattered. We have the greatest mission in the world. And our mission is to make known the name of Jesus, to create disciples. 
says it like this in Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And that's basically... Basically, Luke's saying right here that Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. You are going to tell people about me in Crossville and in Tennessee and in the United States to the very ends of the world. Start where you are, but never let your tongues be set on fire by the Holy Spirit. Because when you know the truth about Jesus, you can't keep it to yourself. That each and every person needs to hear this truth because it's the only thing that truly matters. When we look at the church, I I, I found this quote from... uh, Uh, from an early Roman emperor. He's actually one of the biggest critics of Christianity. His name was uh, Julian. He says this, These despised Christians, the reason they are growing so fast is because not only do they take care of their own poor, they take care of all of our poor too. That's why they're spreading so quickly. Julian says, They're spreading so quickly because they love people. That's essentially that. You can break it down into like seven words. We as Christians, Jesus says, as followers, as disciples of him, we are known simply by our love. That we love our neighbors. That we love those who persecute us, those who go against us, who, those who say bad things about us, those who have different politics than us, those who have different loves than us. We may not agree with their life, but we love them. And we show that love through our actions, and we show that love through our mission, which is, again, to make known the name of Jesus. And the gospel came to all people at one time, so no one was excluded from that. So our mission as the church is to go out and make known the name of Jesus to all people. So my question is, what stops us from doing that? What stops us from actually taking on the mission? What, takes, what stops us from actually serving here at Grace? What stops us from climbing up on the stage and, and singing praise songs to Jesus? And I started to think about that, and I, and I remember a time, probably wasn't all that long ago, honestly, where I thought I wasn't good enough, right? I, I remember a time where I thought, well, listen, I, I, have, a, I have a past, um, and, and what if I'm, I'm doing something around here and then then someone comes, and they see me, and they knew me from my life before, and, and then they're going to think that I'm fake, and then they're going to think this whole church is fake, and so really I'm doing a service by not serving at the church. <laughs> and God quickly shut that one down. Um, and then I remember thinking, man, I, Teresa asked us to come on at youth group. I'm like, I can't lead youth. I wasn't even in youth group. I was out doing things you weren't supposed to do as a teenager. I was like, I can't lead teenagers to Jesus. I didn't know Jesus as a teenager. And and all these excuses come flooding in. And I have to think that so often we have those same excuses. That we think that because of our past, we can't come up here on stage and, and sing worship with the worship team. Or that we can't greet people because someone might come through those doors and they might know who we were just a couple years ago. And they might turn around and walk back out. We may think, you know, I'm, I'm not worthy to serve because I'm not exactly living right. I make mistakes. I, I, I cussed in traffic the other day, right? We so often think that we are too broken for Jesus to use us. Can you, you put up that picture? You see, I think this is the perfect picture of the church. This is the perfect picture of the church, you see, because when we look at this, At first glance, we think this is a painting, right? But no, can we go to that second picture? When we take a closer look at the church, it's not a painting, it's a mosaic. Can I tell you that the church is not a painting? I'll tell you in a minute. (laughs) The church is not a painting, it's a mosaic. 
And what a mosaic is, it's an image that is created not from perfectly curated and cut pieces. Instead, a mosaic is created from broken glass in basically whatever shape they fall. And that when Jesus formed his church, he didn't form it using only perfectly cut, curated pieces. He didn't just go to the temples and grab the perfect people from there. No, he went to the streets and he grabbed the fishermen and the tax collectors. He grabbed this weird dude named Peter who did all sorts of stuff wrong. And if we look forward a little bit, Peter is actually the leader of this ragtag group of outlaws, basically. I mean, and look at what Peter did. Peter, it, by our standards, didn't exactly have the right to be leading this movement to go up and tell 3,000 plus people about Jesus. I mean, Peter, just 40 days before that, wasn't even a Christian anymore. He packed up his boots and got out. Peter cut a dude's ear off. I mean, Peter is the only one that nearly drowned because he doubted. Peter's the only disciple to be called Satan by Jesus himself. Needless to say, by our standards, Peter wasn't fit to form the church. But Jesus doesn't form his church from perfectly cut pieces. He forms his church from broken, rough around the edges people. Because it doesn't matter your past. It doesn't matter what you've done or how messed up you are, or how broken you seem, or how broken you feel, God has a place for you in his mosaic. I mean, if we look at this, and I was just thinking about this, probably not, but if we look at the hair of Jesus here, that could have easily been beer bottles. I doubt it was, but it could have been, because your past doesn't matter when God places you in his church. The things you've done and the mistakes you've made don't matter. Because God has a place for you, and you're never too far gone. He formed his church with broken people like me and like you. Remember that God has a place and a purpose that you will fit perfectly in. And that, that place is to serve, yes, here at the local church, to serve here at Grace, I pray, and, and that you would find your fit here, but it's also to, to go out and to serve his church at work and, and, and in schools and in Walmart because our mission still is not to come to a building. Instead, it's to, yes, come here, gather with your fellow disciples, your fellow brothers and sisters, and be encouraged, not so that we can go sit on the couch and watch Netflix, but to be encouraged so that we can go and accomplish the mission. We don't come here simply to be encouraged and do nothing with it. I think Pastor Dennis said that the Holy Spirit will only come on you if you're going to do something with it. Why would he give you a gift you're not going to use? That's like giving someone a car and then keeping it in the garage. Right, The Spirit of God will come on you and give you a gift when you are intending and planning to use it. And we are to use it for his mission. And that right there is where I had almost intended to end. But there was still something in this passage that was, that was bothering me and is my human broken self. But I, I just want to recap real quick. What happens, I'm going to jump way back for just a moment. Jesus came. He was born. He did amazing things. Jesus healed the sick. He, he gave to the poor. He simply loved everyone. Literally, he's the one person who never did anything wrong. He's literally the only person who had never sinned, who had never messed up, who had never made a mistake. He had never, ever messed up. And yet they take that guy, they take Jesus, and they kill him. In, in what is still thought to be one of the most horrendous ways possible. They hang him on a cross, though he did nothing wrong, despite all the good that he did they still killed him. These very people that Peter is preaching to, Peter actually tells them, the one you crucified. These are the very people who were chanting, crucify him, crucify him. And they chose a criminal over the Messiah. These very people are the ones that get saved on Pentecost. Think about it. You've done a lot wrong, but you didn't physically put Jesus on the cross. Now, we, we spiritually did. He went on the cross for us. So in, 
And, and to be honest, we are just as guilty. But they are the ones who chanted, crucify him. They are the ones who beat him and spit on him and ridiculed him as he walked by, as he drug his cross by. And yet that is who he saves on Pentecost. That is who he builds his church out of. And I just, I'm going back to my human nature here because I'm like, God, they don't deserve it. God, they haven't earned it. God, they are a crooked and vile people. They're not worthy of your love. And I have to think when I actually, because I've watched, I've read it in my Bible, but I've, I've watched it in like the Bible series. And I remember being so mad at those people. When you see it in picture form and it clicks in your brain that these people are going to crucify your Jesus, whom you watched heal people and, and save people and feed the poor. And, and that Jesus that done so many amazing things, you're falling in love with him all over again through this series. And just imagine what all he did. John says that his miracles couldn't fit in all the books in the earth in all the world. Think about all the good he did and all we heard was a highlight reel. He did so much more. That Jesus they took, they hung him on a cross and killed him. And that is who Jesus builds his church out of. And I'm like, that's it's crazy. Leave them to their wicked ways. But then I remember a story, and not a story, it was an event that happened when I was a kid. Uh, one of my favorite memories of my dad. Um, we were out swimming at uh, the Devil's Breakfast Table, which is an odd name anyway. But uh, we were out swimming out there, and really, I was swimming. Mom and Dad were sitting up on like this little cliff edge, just like 10 feet up or so. Um, and I'm just swimming, having a good old time. I'm probably 10 or 11. And all of a sudden, I get startled because I hear a splash right beside me. I'm like, what in the world? And I look over, and it's my dad fully dressed, I believe he still has a cigarette in his mouth, I mean, just head first, and I see him like running up out of the water with a snake in his hand, and he's shaking it down, and, and he takes it over away from all the kids, and he just throws it back in the woods, and, and my art teacher was there actually, and, and I remember she called him the crocodile hunter for like years after that, but, but I remember thinking in that moment, that dude is straight crazy, right? Like, I'm not jumping in no water to grab no snake. I'm going to be like, swim fast, all right? <laughs> but he dove in. He had no concern about his own safety. And just a couple years ago, I realized why. Because a couple years ago, everything changed for me. I had a daughter. I had a child of my own. And I suddenly understood the love of a father. You see, because when I seen that little girl, I realized at that moment I would do anything for her. That I would dive in the water and punch a shark in the face and wrestle an alligator to keep her safe. I would do anything for that little girl. Can I tell you that's what Jesus did for us? That these broken, messed up people, they were still the children of God and the Father's love is reckless. God loves you and me so much, he has no regard for himself. Remember, Jesus says, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. He knew what was to come. He wanted out because he loved, but he loved you so very much that he went to the cross despite his concerns. It was a reckless act. The act, my dad diving in the water that day was incredibly reckless. But the love of a father is reckless. I'm not saying God himself is reckless, I'm saying his love is reckless, that he loves you and me so very much that he was willing to give up his very life to put caution in the wind, to, to get rid of all his reservations and go to the cross so that you and I could have life. The love of a father knows no bounds. God is so good. And God loves you so very much. And I want this to encourage you because these people that he showed up and spoke to and saved on this day were the very ones who hung him on a cross. So whatever you've done, I promise you, if he can forgive them, if he can save them, if he can give them his Holy Spirit and build the church that will change the world out of those people, nothing you have done has made you too far gone. Because God loves you so much 
more than we can comprehend. You see, I love my daughter so much. I would do anything for her. But then I read in scripture that God loves her even more than I do. Wow. I can't imagine that. So if I'm willing to do anything for her, what's he willing to do for her? What's he willing to do for you? What's he willing to do for me? Well, clearly he's willing to give up his own life because he loves you so much. So I, I just, I wanna, I wanna, this, that's where I'm gonna end. I wanna encourage you that you're not too far gone and any mistakes you have made, if you simply pray and say, Jesus, please forgive me, it's done, it's over, it's forgotten. And you can go forward and don't think that you're too far gone, that God doesn't have a purpose for you because he built his church upon the backs of the people who killed him. God has a purpose and a mission and he has a grand love that we know nothing about. So wherever you are, whatever you've done, you are loved beyond measure. You are loved more than you can imagine. And that's the God we serve, the one who loves and gives himself for us. Let's pray. I want to speak for just a moment as we bow our heads and close our eyes to anyone here that may not know this love that we speak of today. That maybe you've fallen away or you've never accepted Jesus that you've never taken that step, you've never accepted the love that God has to offer, this gift that was given at Pentecost. If that's you today, I just wanna give you that opportunity. It says in scripture that if we believe in our hearts and say with our mouth that we'll be saved, we say Jesus is Lord. And I believe that today. So on the count of three, if that's you and you wanna make that decision, you wanna accept that love of Jesus we're talking about today, I just want you to raise your hand up and put it right back down. We simply believe that a physical response to have something happen inward, inwardly just solidifies it. So if that's you today and you wanna make that decision, on the count of three, I just want you to raise your hands up and you can put it right back down. One, two, three. Awesome, awesome. If that was you today and you had your hand up and you wanna make that decision, I just want you to pray after me. You're gonna pray this prayer to God. You're gonna pray it to Jesus. Say, Jesus, Today I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I believe you died on the cross to pay for my sins and that God the Father resurrected you from the grave. Jesus, I repent of all my sins. I give you my entire life. Jesus, today I am yours. Amen. Let's pray as a body. Lord, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you so much for everything you've done for us and you've done through us, God. You love us more than we will ever know. God, you are so good. God, I just thank you so much for each and every person here today. You know their hearts. You know their struggles and their pains. Be with each and every person here, Lord. Lead them, guide them. Give them strength and courage where they need it. God, I just pray that each and every one of us will know that you have a purpose, you have a calling, you have a mission for us. And I pray that we would have the strength and the courage to let go of anything holding us back and to step forward in you. Jesus, I thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.